Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, it is my pleasure to chair this session and introduce to you the winner of this year's ESRB Research Prize in memory of Ieke Vandenburg. As the conference program says, the prize is awarded annually to recognize outstanding research conducted by young scholars on topics related to the ESRB mission. The prize was established in year 2014 in memory of Ieke van der Burg, a member of the ESRB ASC, the first ASC, and also a member of parliament in the years in which uh, the financial crisis uh, started. We received a very good uh, number of uh, candidate papers uh, that were uh, assessed at the Advisory Scientific Committee that I have the pleasure to chair. This year, as in previous years, we got a significant number of very good papers on very punctually addressing issues connected to systemic risk and macro prudential policies. We discussed the shortlisted papers in one of our meetings. And uh, apart from the paper that has won the prize, there are other front runners that will be invited in forthcoming uh, weeks to submit their papers, if still unpublished, to the ESRB working paper series that the ASC is also editing. The ASC decided to award this year's prize to the paper, and this is a title that you don't have, so this is the surprise of my talk today, to the paper Disentangling the Effects of a Banking Crisis, Evidence from German Banks and Counties. There is uh, uh, a paper of which uh, Kilian Hoover, uh, the winner, uh, is a solo author and he's gonna present his paper in, in, in a few minutes. Kilian was a PhD student at the London School of Economics, I think, at the time of producing uh, the paper, and was in the job market last fall, as a result of which he's been recruited by the University of Chicago. He's currently a research fellow in macroeconomics at the Becker Friedman Institute, and later in 2019, he will join as an assistant professor of economics, the Booth School of Business. I don't want to spoil his presentation, saying anything about the winning paper. I will make my own remarks about the winning paper after we hear uh, his presentation. But I can say that the quality of the paper is being certified not only by us, but also by its uh, recent uh, publication in the American Economy Review. So, Kilian, uh, congratulations, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Javier, to the whole ESRB, in particular, uh, Eva and Thomas, who did a great job inviting me and dealing with all my annoying questions, and thanks to all of you, uh, for being here today. So this paper is about a banking crisis in Germany. Now I want to motivate this paper by showing you a picture of a very unhappy banker. All his investments are pointing downward, and as we're well aware, there was a huge systemic global banking crisis in 2008 and 2009. Now at the same time, there was a huge global recession, right? So starting in 2008 in most countries, we see here GDP in four advanced economies. I could have plotted this to many other advanced economies. GDP dropped sharply. Subsequently, there was some sense of recovery, but unlike most pre-war, post-war recessions, actually, there was no catch-up to trend, right? So if you look at the GDP here, it kind of grows on a parallel trend to the pre-crisis growth in many countries without any sign of convergence to the growth path it would have been on had it not been for the recession. So we see a large financial crisis. We see a large recession in many countries. And that's, of course, not unusual, as many of you are aware. You know, banking crises and deep recessions often coincide. I've listed a few famous examples here. Probably the, the most famous and the most devastating in terms of economic output was the Great Depression in the late 1920s, 1930s, all over the world. We've got the Swedish and Finnish crises in the 1990s, Japan, the East Asian crisis all in the 1990s, and, of course, the recent recession. Now, an important question is, what causes this coincidence? 
So is it that losses in the banking sector, that reductions in lending in the banking sector cause this type of growth pattern we see? So is there a causal effect running from banking crisis to recessions? That's an important question for a number of reasons. Now, first of all, you know, this whole conference, in a sense, is about systemic stability, ensuring the financial system works well. And what I'm going to try and do in this paper is to quantify how important, how valuable a stable banking system can be by estimating how large the losses, the real economic losses are, when the economy goes into a banking crisis. Of course, there's also other policy implications of this research. For example, if we know what causes the relationship between the banking sector and the real economy, we might be able to better target um, you know, the channels, the mechanisms through which banking crises call, perhaps cause real economic losses. Of course, also there's this big question out there in the policy debate, how much should we care about the banks? Is there like an intrinsic value to bailing out banks? It's a very contentious issue in the public policy debate. Now, if banking crises cause real crises, that's a pretty strong argument for trying to stabilize the banking sector once there's a crisis. And then, of course, there's still this ongoing debate, which I alluded to just now, which is about why has the real economy converged, well, not really converged, and recovered so slowly after the global crisis? Has this got something to do with the persistent effects of the banking crisis? Or are there perhaps just repeated shocks that keep hitting the real economy that have caused a slow recovery since 2008? Now, it's an important question, but it's also a very hard question. And the reason it's a hard question is that this banking system is extremely endogenous to the real economy. In particular, what we worry about when we're trying to estimate real effects of banking crisis is something we technically call, technically call reverse causality. Right? So it could be that there's a lot of other stuff going on in the real economy. There's a recession, and then banks, you know, they do worse because they're debtors default, for example. They get less payback on their loans. And as a result, we always observe banks doing poorly when the real economy is doing poorly. Now, the recent recession is a very good example of this because, of course, we saw lots of things going on in the real economy, in particular a housing crisis in many countries. As a result, people who lost a lot of value on their houses had to cut spending. Maybe that led to a recession, and maybe that only, as an afterthought, sort of affected banks. Of course, governments got into trouble all over the world, you know, especially in Europe, but even the US experienced a rating downgrade. There was a lot of uncertainty. So it could be that all these factors actually cause real economic losses, and as a result, these losses cause a banking crisis. Now, we want to, what we want to do to overcome this problem is to run an experiment. Okay? Ideally, we randomly shock a few banks, deplete their capital stocks in various countries across time, and then we see what happens in these economies. Now, fortunately, we're not allowed to do that. Of course, we're not allowed to randomize you know, huge welfare losses across countries. So we have to find the second best solution. And the second best solution is quasi-randomization. It's what we call a natural experiment. So I'm going to identify a natural experiment in this paper and use that experiment to try and causally identify the effects of the banking crisis on the real economy. In particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on one large German bank called Commerzbank. Most of you are probably aware that Commerzbank suffered pretty large losses in the recent financial crisis. By the way, whenever I say Commerzbank here, I include Dresdner Bank, which Commerzbank acquired in 2009. So I'm just going to treat them together because both of them you know, suffered from international investments in the crisis. Now, Commerzbank was in crisis starting in 2007. It was really hit hard in 2008, 2009. By 2011, there's evidence that Commerzbank stabilized again. Now, why am I focusing on Commerzbank? Well, the important aspect about Commerzbank's activities is that it lost a lot of money from international investments, but actually the firms that it was lending to in Germany looked pretty stable. Okay? So for Commerzbank, there's strong evidence that firms that were reliant on Commerzbank's loan supply and other financial services would have grown at the same rate as firms dependent on other banks had it not been for the shock to Commerzbank. Right? And that's a bit harder to, to show for other banks, and that's why I focus on Commerzbank here. I should also point out that I'm not on a vendetta against Commerzbank, right? This is a temporary shock against this bank. Kind of a, a mix of unfortunate circumstances contributed to the losses. Commerzbank completely refocuses operations after the crisis. There's actually evidence that it's done much better and stabilized, so you know, no one should go away from this presentation and say, oh, well, you know, that's where you worry about Commerzbank and the firms it's, it's lending to. This is kind of a temporary episode. Right. So here's just a picture, a part of the evidence that I have to show you that the crisis was not really caused by what's happening on Commerzbank's 
real portfolio, but rather on you know, in investments in international financial markets. And on this picture, you can see that trading and investment income essentially explains all of the losses in profit pre-tax of Commerce Bank, whereas interest income, which among other things includes you know, the income from lending to firms and customers, is actually pretty stable and increasing and then slightly dropping after 2008. But it's hard to argue that you know, the losses and profits come from the blue line rather than the, the green line. Here's Commerce Bank's lending stock. It drops sharply compared to other banks in 2008, 2009. Interesting perhaps is to see that actually the German banking system as a whole did relatively well. Right? So there were a lot of banks that actually increased lending in the crisis. You can see that in the blue line. It's actually slightly trending upward. Okay, so let me be more precise about the what I mean by the natural experiment here. Okay, so German firms traditionally form close relationships to banks. Right? They rely on these banks for financial services for a long time. There's a lot of uh, you know, soft information involved in the sense of the banker knows the entrepreneur, knows the guy running the firm, and they trust each other, and as a result, they start working together. There's also this, this very German word called Hausbanken, which literally translated means home banks. Okay, you kind of have a bank that you take into your home. Okay, I'm going to call these relationship banks in English. That's the best translation I could find. So some German firms have relationships to Commerzbank, Bank, pre-existing relationships before the crisis. Other firms don't. And the natural experiment is really that some firms are shocked without having caused you know, anything that would make them receive fewer loans, such as having lower credit worthiness. Some firms are shocked, other firms are not, because they're exposed to healthier banks in the crisis, and that's the natural experiment. So I'm going to compare, first of all, firms located in the same region, in the same industry, of the same age, similar structure overall. I'm going to compare two firms, one of them borrowing from Commerce Bank, the other not. Then I'm going to scale it up, look at the regional level, and then I'm going to ask the question, well, what happens if you're not directly exposed to Commerce Bank, but you're in a region where many other guys around you are exposed to Commerce Bank. So other sort of regional spillover effects, even if you're not directly affected. Before I show you the results, let me just give you one more piece of evidence. So there's a firm survey asked by the IFO Institute in Munich. And they ask banks, how do you evaluate the current willingness of your, uh, sorry, ask firms, how do you evaluate the current willingness of banks to grant loans? You know, are you getting loans pretty easily or is it hard for you to get loans? Now, firms dependent on Commerce Bank answer that their loan supply is more restrictive in 2009, 2010 compared to other firms. This is not true before or after the crisis. This is also not true when these firms are asked about you know, product demand. Are you struggling to sell products? So it looks like really there's a shock hitting these firms that comes through you know, the, the banking sector, but there's not other shocks in terms of lower demand for their products hitting these firms. And by the way, let me also add here again, you know, the evidence from 2012 onward actually suggests that Commerce Bank is expanding loan supply relative to, to other banks, so that firms dependent on Commerce Bank report having more generous loan supplies. So again, it looks like you know, Commerce Bank managed to turn things around a little bit after the crisis. Okay, three levels of results. I've just mentioned this. First of all, looking at the firm level, so are there direct effects when you're directly borrowing from Commerce Bank? Second of all, looking at the regional level, a region that's more exposed to Commerce Bank on average. Does that region grow more slowly when Commerce Bank cuts lending? And then third, what if you're a firm in a high exposure region, but with low exposure you know, directly? So this is the employment of firms dependent on Commerce Bank between 2006 and 2012. You see that the firms dependent on Commerce Bank grow at the same rate as firms not dependent on Commerce Bank. Okay, so the red and the blue line kind of follow similar trends. And then there's the shock. In late 2008, Lehman goes down, the financial system implodes. As a result, these firms are struggling to get adequate financial services, and that's actually real effect. Okay? So they reduce their employment growth. For about two years, you see the red line growing more slowly than the blue line. And thereafter, the lines are sort of on a parallel trend with not really any sign of convergence. Right? Even though these firms now report in the survey that they're able to access bank loans more easily again. There's no evidence that this leads to a real recovery as well in the sense of them catching up to the levels of unaffected firms. Think back to what I showed you in the second picture, which was about the real GDP, right? The drop and then parallel trend. This is kind of similar. So I think that's interesting. You know, the causal effects of the banking crisis seem to resemble what the time series of GDP in different countries say about what happened after the financial crisis. Now, this was just the raw data. I do more sophisticated statistical analyses. You know, I control for the region, the county that you're located in. I control for industry, for size, for firm age, for how dependent are you on exports, how many, how many of your inputs do you get from imports. Um, I compare the results to some 
customers of other banks that are in crisis, you know, such as the Lunders Bank, in which I've been heavily publicized and so on. But it generally remains true that firms dependent on Commerce Bank grow more slowly during the years of the crisis. And this is true for employment, as I showed you, but also for investment and also for patenting. Okay? So long-term investment and innovation also seems to go down when you're hit by a temporary banking shock. Second set of results. Now, this is data on how dependent regions are on Commerce Bank. Okay? So what's the average share um, of bank relationships in a region, in a county or in German Kreis, uh, of firms in that county is aggregated up from the from the firm level data. You can see the darker regions are more dependent on Commerzbank. Bank. Quite noteworthy is that the eastern part of Germany is heavily dependent on Commerzbank. Bank. Okay, private banks moved into the east relatively quickly after the wall came down. And also some west, western regions are more dependent on Commerzbank, Bank, generally for historic reasons. Hamburg, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, for example, which I've marked out here. They were uh, temporary head offices of Commerzbank Bank after World War II. And Commerzbank Bank expanded quite strongly around these temporary head offices. So it was broken up uh, by, the, by the Allies for about 10 years. It had temporary head offices in these three, three cities. And um, I use this, a little bit of technical speak now, I use this to construct an instrument for how dependent our regions on Commerce Bank sort of depends on their distance to one of these historic head offices. Okay? So I use both just the raw difference across regions in Commerce Bank dependence. I always use this historic IV to get a sense of where does the variation come from in Commerce Bank dependence. Again, I control for you know, lots of observables that you might think might affect regional growth uh, during and after the crisis. So whether you're located in the east of Germany, what does your in industrial stru structure look like? How dependent are firms in the regions on exports and imports? Is there Landesbank that's struggling? How big is the county? How productive is the county? How indebted are households in that county? All of that actually makes very little difference. Okay? The results generally look like this. If anything, growth of counties dependent on Commerce Bank is slightly higher up to 2008. And then the growth rate is lower during the years of the lending cut. And subsequently, it's sort of a little bit lower, certainly not any higher. And what this implies in terms of the aggregate growth pattern of these counties is that it's very similar to the firm level growth patterns. Okay? So there's a decrease during the years of the lending cut. And subsequently, there's parallel growth again, but no evidence of any convergence. Right, so we've established, uh, right, so again, this is, this is just making the point again, you know, there's, there's persistent effects. There's no evidence of convergence of the lending cut. So we've established that there's effects directly on firms borrowing from Commerce Bank. There's effects on the region overall. And now I want to start the following thought experiment. Imagine you're running a firm. You're not directly exposed to Commerce Bank, okay? You're borrowing from other banks. These banks are doing fine in the crisis. But lots of firms around you in your region are borrowing from Commerce Bank are exposed to the crisis. Now, is that good for you or is that bad for you? Now, economists have written down many models about this, identified many potential channels, and in theory, it's completely ambiguous. So on the one hand, it's kind of good for you when other guys around you are struggling. Why is that? Because they're going to fire their workers. You probably have to pay these workers a little bit less. Right? The regional wage goes down. You can buy your inputs more cheaply. You can buy your workers more cheaply. And as a result, you can grow faster. So great, you just take over the market share of the guys you know, that are struggling to get bank loans, struggling to grow because of that. Now, on the other hand, there might be negative effects. Okay? Firms are firing their workers. Now, it could be that, as a result, people are buying much less in the region. Right? There's a decrease in demand. If I'm getting fired, I'm not going to go to the fancy restaurant. I'm just going to go you know, to a, a small chain around the corner. And that's bad for the fancy restaurants. So maybe some firms are actually suffering because of a decrease in demand. A third reason. A uh, third channel, a second reason for why firms might actually suffer is that there might be spillover effects. Okay? So it could be that there's some kind of spillover from some guy producing next to me. Now, there's been a lot written about this. I mean, Silicon Valley is sort of the standard example about this. All the high-tech firms are running to Silicon Valley. Why? Well, maybe there's something about being where other good guys are that's making you more productive. Okay? It could be, for example, that Apple comes up with a great idea. And that's really good for the firm next door, because they can steal that idea or profit a little bit from the, from the new technology. It could also be that Apple has a great new idea, and now it needs lots of regional suppliers to provide that very particular charger for the iPod. Right? And so the producers of that charger are very happy, because there's now this input linkage, the input effect that makes firms more productive just by being located in one region. And so that type of spillover effect might be a reason that firms are actually suffering when other firms around them are doing poorly. So what I, I call these spillover effects indirect effects. 
And the headline finding of the paper is, firms with no direct relationship to Commerz Bank, but located in high exposure regions, grow more slowly on average. Okay, so it looks like the economic mechanisms are larger in the negative direction. In particular, I can split firms up. I can look at different kinds of firms. Okay, I can look at firms that are producing to sell in the region in particular. They're producing non-tradables. Okay, it's hard to, to sell their products in other regions, and so they're relying on local demand. These guys are doing very poorly when other firms in their region are hit by the lending cut. There's also some evidence that if you're in a high innovation sector and other firms around you that are also high innovators are hit by the lending cut, you also you know, do more, more poorly, you grow more slowly, your employment growth more slowly between 2008 and 2012. Now the mechanism for that could be what I mentioned last, right? It could be some kind of innovation spillover, some input-output channels that are particularly important in high innovation industries that generate a negative effect, a negative indirect effect on other firms in the region. Okay, so this is kind of important when we think about systemic stability, because it doesn't look like there's just one channel that leads from banking crisis to firms through a direct financial channel, but these effects spread out through the economy. Okay, they filter through the economy through various economic mechanisms. And so, if we so far, a few studies have looked at firm level effects. Okay, I'm borrowing from a firm, I'm borrowing from an unhealthy bank. What happens to me? That's going to underestimate the effects at the regional level because there's these negative indirect spillover effects. So the systemic effects of a crisis at the regional level are larger than what would have been implied by just looking at the firm level results. So let me just conclude, let me tell you, I had three sets of results. Firms grew more slowly when Commerce Bank cut lending, and they recovered sluggishly after 2010. Regions grew more slowly, counties grew more slowly after the lending cut, and they also recovered sluggishly. And in particular, between the direct firm level and the regional results are these indirect spillovers, which are negative. And so they exacerbate the effects of a banking crisis. Right? The effects are worse than if we just look at the firm level results. Now thinking about broader picture, what, do, what does this mean for policy? Well, a banking crisis can affect lots of firms, even if they're not directly exposed to unhealthy banks. This is interesting when we think about a debate that's been going after the Great Recession, which says, well, a lot of firms are complaining about low demand. Hence, the initial shock to the economy must have been a demand shock. The, the results of my paper you know, throw some doubt onto this reasoning. Because even if lots of firms are complaining about low demand, the initial shock could have been a supply side shock, could have been a financial shock. Also interesting when we look at you know, the growth slowdown uh, in, the, in the global economies, Secular stagnation has been a term that's been thrown around. You know, it could be that this is really the persistent effect of a really, really bad banking crisis, perhaps the worst banking crisis we've ever had you know, in the last um, 100 years. So for policy, you know, if we want to think about what do we do when the banking crisis happens, don't just bail out the banks and leave it there. Think about what else you can do. Can we stimulate demand? Can we stimulate innovation to try and get rid of these indirect effects and get rid of these persistent effects? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Kilian. I think your your very clear presentation was was a demonstration of of, of the value of the research that we were uh, uh, awarding uh, through this uh, through this prize. As I said uh, before, when presenting uh, you, I didn't want to spoil uh, the contents of the paper by advancing the, the reasons why we thought this was a, a winning paper. Let, let me now uh, elaborate briefly on how the results of the paper uh, qualify for a very good paper and also for a paper relevant to the, to the ESRB. So this paper, as Killian has shown, uh, documents the effects of weakening of banks' capital position in the case of commerce banks due to, as argued, uh, 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 other assets than loans, other assets than local loans, uh, German loans, but, but assets uh, possibly localized uh, uh, outside Germany, on, on the domestic lending of uh, that bank uh, to, to, to the firms uh, uh, to which it was, uh, it was connected. Uh, of course, there is literature already uh, saying about the effects of a, a capital shock on the lending uh, that banks get directly involved in. Uh, what uh, makes this paper most novel is, is, the, is the fact that it also documents uh, indirect effects on other uh, firms' uh, uh, place located in the same uh, county. 
the paper shows that uh, local indirect effects are stronger for firms that operate, produce uh, non-tradable goods, uh, and, uh, which suggests the importance of local demand externalities. So it's, it's, it's by Commerce Bank not lending as much to the uh, firms depending on it in the counties that are analyzed, these firms are sort of weakening the demand of other firms in the same counties. Therefore, the, we find, you find this uh, uh, fall in their, uh, in their uh, activity, in their employment. And, and, and also, you find uh, this local indirect effect to highly innovative firms. The, the effects are large uh, uh, on impact. Moreover, they are persistent, as, as you also document. And the paper offers evidence that the uh, persistency comes uh, from uh, the damage to firms' productivity. You were very modest. You, you were uh, actually uh, following directions, offering a non-technical uh, presentation. So lots of good empirical results without uh, regression tables. Uh, but uh, uh, in the paper, uh, uh, you, you check that uh, the effects uh, operate uh, through a productivity growth of firms with a high uh, patenting activity in the past in those countries that get affected by, by the credit crunch. And, and overall, actually, and I think this is my inside knowledge from uh, Kilian's experience in the job market, this, this made your uh, job market profile attractive not only to finance people, which is a most a standard crowd, at least in my own uh, environment, but also to macro, uh, to macro uh, people. Uh, it's looking beyond finance, and actually, this is why MacroPro is, uh, is uh, special, uh, exactly in that uh, interface. Methodologically, the paper sustains its results on a state-of-the-art identification strategies. Identification is key. We could find correlations which are totally spurious and, and so little on, 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 the, on, the, on the true uh, causal uh, connection. Uh, uh, and, and you work uh, on the direct effects, but as I said before, on the indirect effects, talking about demand externalities and agglomeration externalities, which makes really your paper uh, have a clear uh, space uh, in, in the literature. From a macroprudential perspective, uh, the paper shows several channels through which macroprudential policy is important for the real economy. So eventually we are talking about the real economy. In so far as macropru can prevent situations in which banks suffer uh, big uh, losses, we will be preventing the real effects that this paper documents. The paper is also important, I think, in the direction of helping calibrate how important is things that we do in the macroprudential uh, area. So directly or perhaps indirectly, the quantitative results of the paper are saying on the importance of latent parameters for the calibration of macroprudential policy. So how difficult it is for banks in the short run to replace capital which is lost due to asset losses with, say, capital raising the markets, with the consequence being that a shock like the one suffered during the global financial crisis imply a decline in bank loan supply. You, 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 you saw clearly this impact. And then you also saw the lack of substitutability of, uh, the, the, of the supply of credit provided by Commerce Bank, at least for the firms whose employment suffers due to it. Uh, which is another channel we take into account when thinking that credit cycles might be bad for uh, social uh, well-being. By, 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 uh, uh, it's not just that credit by banks can be replaced easily by other credit, at least not uh, uh, in the context of the recent crisis. And finally, you illustrate about externality. So the effects are not only for the affected firms, the, f the effects are also for other firms in the same counties. You don't have data or you haven't explored the household angle, but I guess that if Commerce Bank was also involved in lending to German households, you will have similar demand effects operating possibly through household uh, credit. So, okay, with this uh, in mind, uh, we have a few minutes for questions from the floor, if you have. I guess uh, Kilian will be pleased to, to answer or elaborate. <laughs>
If not, if not, uh, let me uh, close the session. We have a expanded coffee break by formally awarding the prize. It's a, it's a virtual prize so far to Kilian. Please uh, join me in applauding him for his uh, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.